<laughs> All right. Another beautiful day in paradise. Yes. Well, we've had a string of them. Yes, right. beautiful morning. I don't think I've ever, yeah, since I've been here, I can't remember the, 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 the pretty weather. Yeah, oh, that's right. Humidity is slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, I'm sad to say, happy to say, we set an another record out of the park yesterday. Um, um, you know the number? I don't know the number, but the last vehicle we loaded had 16. 16. 16. 750. So it's it's almost climbing by five to ten percent a week, which is when you think about it, it's just astounding. It's just astounding. Um, so it's, the sad in that is um, obviously people are struggling, and this is the way that they're making ends meet. You know, uh, many are uh, working, right? Because they come they come right in line with their with their shirts from the factory or from their, their workplace, and so uh, that's something else. Uh, but 750, I just could keep wow. thinking, I, I thought that uh, COVID, I said this multiple times, but, you know, after COVID, the number was going down. So what about 350 yeah. at COVID? And that was busy, right? I mean, yeah. you guys weren't like sitting around drinking. And but think about 755. Yeah. So yeah. I know Ray, you were out there. Maggie. Maggie was out there yesterday. Anybody else from this group? Um, and I, I just couldn't be more pleased with the congregation of just regularly just doing, this is just the blocking and tackling, if that's a good metaphor. It's your kale and spinach and your, <laughs> and your eating your vegetables of a Christian church. Does that make sense? Am I, am I make, you know, this is, you know, there's no glory in it necessarily. It's just the things that Christian churches should be doing. It's just what we should be doing. You, know, you feed people who are hungry, right? Um, and you don't ask questions. You just feed. Now, it's Meals of Hope does a great job controlling all these things. And, uh, but boy, think of the food that has to be assembled. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just what it takes, not just for volunteers, but for Meals of Hope to get that much food. Assembled. And that's one spot, and they have multiple spots. Right. Yeah. Now we're the major spot um, still, and still, I mean, getting even. And St. Matthew's is feeding, I don't know, thousands of St. Matthew's has a warehouse. Has a very different program. They have a warehouse now, yeah. Yeah. Um, pick it up. Uh, and they're going to do their district. We went over there because we do a lot of St. Matthew's house, as you know. And they're going to change their paradigm. Mm -hmm. So we'll watch to see. They're going to build a warehouse so that when you go in, the food will be there and people can then pick out the food they want. Oh. So when you go by ours, you get you what get you get. Yeah. <clears throat> Whether your family likes that or not, you get what you get. So it's more of a crisis mode where they want to have classes on nutrition. So you come in there and, okay, you can take food out that you like. But then there will be, uh, and how how can you feed your family better? And what uh, nutritionally, how do you get the most out of what's here? And those types of things. So it's not as much a crisis mode as sort of an educational mode now to kind of slow things down and and um, and it gives them a little more dignity because it's like they're shopping mm -hmm. as opposed to just receiving yeah, hand out. Correct. So it's not the crisis mode like you know after um, after in. The dignity is just getting food, but after a while, then it's choosing the dignity is choosing your own food and learning, uh, like all of us have to learn, right? How how does nutrition work, right? And as um, I was always impressed learning the history of um, uh, the home economics departments around the country, and that was, you know, people immigrants coming to the United States and. You can't eat in the United States like you ate in Germany or Ireland or anyplace else. So what grows here? Mm -hmm. How do you thrive as a family? What should you be planting? What should you be eating? How do you fix kale? None of you grew up eating kale, right? Yeah. Still don't. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, 
So then, you know, and doesn't this happen in Publix or wherever you go shopping? You walk around and you see certain vegetables or, or fruits, you go, what is that? So it's constantly bringing in new things, but uh, um, obviously, and you get a lot of restaurants doing this now, uh, they'll say we only buy local produce. Well, there is something about local produce, right? It's going to probably be more nutritious because it grows locally. It doesn't have to travel halfway around the world to get into... And it supports our people. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, all going on there. So in any case, uh, just wonderful news and bad news at the same time. And uh, I don't think that number is going to go down. It's not, it doesn't it's seem not, like it's going down. It's going to be going up maybe because they said inflation is still with us. Groceries are like 33% more. Everybody knows. We all know. We walk into the stores. We know what it is. It's, you spend you spend a lot and you get little. Yeah. And they're feeling it. And people are feeling it. Yeah. So it's it's um, so it's good that we can uh, be helpful to 750 fan, you know, uh, I had said it was basically the feeding of the 4,000. We're, get, we're, gonna, we're getting there. <laughs> but we may get to the feeding of the 5,000 every Wednesday uh, pretty soon. That's 755 families. And I guess Meals of Hope does the math times six. So uh, um, we're, we're inching up to the 5,000 mark. Um, secondly, I hope that you'll watch the uh, Sunday Forum. We're talking about witnessing. We started that last week. It's going to be a two-part series. So if you see, it's actually a three-part series. So we did one on martyrdom uh, two weeks ago. Um, use of that word. The word in the New Testament, martyr, is just a witness. Now, we associate with someone whose witness leads to death. Uh, but that wasn't the original term. Um, you're a witness, you're a martyr. Um, uh, when we practiced last Sunday just some techniques on how to give a witness. And the reason we're doing that is Lutherans aren't known for being bold witnesses. That's kind of scary, you know. Uh, we tend to be a shyer lot. And so how do you do that in an organic way that's more natural? It's not just, you know, the four spiritual laws or the Kennedy of answers and questions or whatever it might be. So uh, we're going to do that again this Sunday, and we'll have uh, uh, some more techniques uh, that we'll share with that. Um, so I hope that you'll watch those. Uh, if you went to the Sunday Forum last Sunday, I'm sure you'll recognize this one because it's sort of a repeat. But, it's, but, it, but now it's on video, which is... I, I hope for it. Nice. What else? I got back last week from a um, trip to Chicago where I it was the 50th anniversary of Seminex. And I shared a little bit about this already, uh, but that was the walkout of the St. Louis, Missouri Senate Seminary uh, 50 years ago. And of the 600 students, 550 walked out. And of the 60 faculty, 55 walked out. So basically the whole school walked out and uh, declared a moratorium. Uh, at that time, the president, Preuss, um, declared that faculty at the seminary were teaching heresy and uh, it was gonna stop. The students, because it was in the 70s, declared a moratorium and said, we shouldn't be going to class and learning theology from heretics. So we are not going back to class until you name names. You got to name who the faculty are and what's the heresy. And the faculty thought that was pretty clever. So they said, well, since the students aren't going to class, we won't go to class. So they all just walked, took the cross uh, and, and marched off the campus, uh, thinking that it would be solved by Monday. <laughs> so it didn't. And so the whole experience lasted 10 years. Uh, I went to the school after four years, after four years after the walkout. By the time Missouri Senate had already clamped down um, on the senior colleges, could no longer send students to Seminex, and the district presidents were fired who would send students to Seminex. So it got pretty brutal. <clears throat> All the faculty lost their homes, their, uh, um, their salaries, their pensions, uh, everything, because everybody lived on campus at that time. So it was quite an experiment of those 10 years. And so this was, you know, all the 250 people um, came and kind of shared stories, war stories. So it was, it was good. I, uh, most of the faculty have died, but uh, the students were there. So again, it was, it was a, 
that well, I, I just found it fascinating. What do you think is going to happen with these students today walking out? I'm yeah, I'm, we're going to do. Um, I'm going to do a forum on that pretty soon, mm -hmm. uh, looking at Columbia because it's a mess, mm -hmm. but it's a. Um, it's gotten so complex, it's hard to dig your way out uh, of something that complex. You know, so, some of it's righteous, some of it's um, ignorance. <laughs> uh, some of it, it uh, I don't know about ignorance. Um, some of it's exploitative. It's hard to do a protest now, a big one, because there, there are groups who will always exploit every protest. It just, they do, that they just, that's what they do. And so uh, if you can, a small protest is often now more effective because everybody knows why they're there and can stay within the boundaries. But larger protests now just uh, uh, attract all sorts of different groups with all sorts of different opinions. And uh, then it's hard to stay on message. So you've got um, the war in Gaza, which is, I don't think anybody defends that anymore. It's, uh, you know, when you got 34,000 uh, dead, Something's not right in the way the war is being conducted. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a righteous side of it. You know, they were attacked uh, brutally, you know, in October. And you got to be able to defend yourselves. So there's the righteous side of it. And then there's the unrighteous side that you can't just conduct war any way you want to conduct war. And that's before Rafa. I think going to Rafa, we all know that's going to be a mess. Uh, we haven't had a, a state conduct war where um, they use the tools of um, water, electricity, that you're actually, it was an old type of war the Romans used to, you know, where you um, isolate a population and just starve them to death. Well, we haven't seen that. Now we're seeing that again. Uh, is that righteous? So then it comes here and some are trying to, to protest the war and others are trying to, to um, support Netanyahu and the government in their defense of themselves, and yet then everybody comes in and has other opinions, and it mixes with anti-Semitism and... Um, Big time. Uh, Why don't our Christian colleges step in and help those Jewish students that are afraid of their lives on these campuses? Well, who I'm going to interview is one of our members here who um, was the president of Valparaiso University. It's Mark Heffer. And I know he's being, he's traveling all around the country now to all sorts of colleges to consult with them on how, and he's been doing it for months. Okay. So it's the, the colleges, um, it kind of reminds me of, of the 60s and 70s when yeah. we had protests in the war. And um, I'm trying to remember how I felt during you know, all those protests and, uh, and I think there was, again, it was a kind of a mess. There was a righteous side of it. There was an unrighteous side of it. And it was all mixed together. And, you know, and uh, what does Martin think about us sending more money to Israel? Uh, uh, um, this is all part of, we're, we're, we're implicit in all of it. Right. And, um, I mean, as you know, that some of the protests uh, of some congressmen of saying, how can we, we're breaking our own laws because the law says you're supposed to, all weapons that we send to any friend has to be controlled on how they use them. And we're not practicing that. Why are we not practicing that? Um, on the other hand, you know, Iran takes liberties of attacking with how many drones? Oh, that? Was like 300, yeah. I don't know, yeah. a massive yeah. amount. Right. So if you pull back too much, are you weakening Israel against their attacks? That's why I say it's a mess. There's a righteous side, I think, of both sides of the debate. And then there's a lot of unrighteousness in there uh, about how do we use weapons, um, anti-Semitism, which has been on the crease actually for a couple of years now, and now oh, even more. Yeah. Um, and yet uh, there's a dynamic in the Jewish community that they uh, often don't for good reason, I think, don't let us see is that there's a massive debate back and forth in the Jewish community about this war. And there's a lot of Jews opposing the war in Gaza. But they don't like to have that debate publicly because they're afraid of anti-Semitic responses, mm -hmm. which, which always happens, always happens. And we see it a lot in Florida too, as you know, 
before this all happened, there were uh, you know, a lot of anti-Semitic um, protests, mm -hmm. you know, even on on some of our roadways, you know. Yeah. And, um, but some of these kids haven't even heard of a Holocaust or yeah, what right. went on in World War II. They don't know. They don't understand. They're and they're, you know, protesting, and they don't know. I'm not. I'm sure there's some of that, but most of these are college students. And, you know, that doesn't matter. They're not teaching history. Yeah. Yeah. Don't um, I, I, I don't take that. Uh, I mean, there's ignorance. Always there's ignorance. Uh, but there's also um, most. A lot of them do know the history that uh, uh, Gaza is part of an occupied territory. It's an occupation, and as an occupation. Um, you have certain moral duties as the occupier to take care of the population. You just can't cut the population off from all food and electricity. Yeah. So I think the, the, the there's a righteousness to the protests about you can't conduct war this way. And as an occupying force, uh, under the rules of war, you can't do that. So usually this, you know, it's kind of like in the 60s. There was certain righteous rebellion against Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, my dad, my dad just hated it if I came home and talked about the war. Because for him, um, there was a righteousness to what Nixon was trying to accomplish. And he wanted to talk about it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and so he said, well, you're not participating in any of that. No, of course not, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I remember picking up David. I, the car was surrounded by students pounding on it. And here comes David flying out of the business department with a big cloud of tear gas behind him. I, that was fun getting on and off the campus. <laughs> so you notice... The professors are also joining with the students yes. in the protest, so they, they're knowledgeable, so. and that's often not acknowledged in some of our TV debates back and forth. That uh, what happens if both sides have a righteous side of the argument, yes. which we know in life is often what happens. There are two rights don't always fit together. Yes. Israel's right to defend itself and uh, uh, the right to uh, much better treatment from Gaza, you know, sort of not being um, killed indiscriminately, not being fed, not, not allowing provisions to enter, that those are war crimes. Just it seems it's easier to hate Jews than it is Hamas, which is a terrorist group. I don't make the comparisons because I think uh, it's harder for us to defend Palestinians who we don't know. It's easier for us, I think, in the West to defend Jews who we do know. We grew up with Jewish communities. Yeah. Most of you have Jewish friends. And so, uh, and most of us um, who are Lutheran understand the complexities and our guilt in World War II that we did not defend the Jewish community and we were part of the whole Nazi. And even if there were many Lutherans who didn't support Hitler and that, they didn't protest it either. No. Right. They, just they were complicit yeah. in what happened. And so Lutherans have, we I think, pretty well acknowledged, you know, and you have some righteous leaders like Bonhoeffer who stood up against the Nazi regime and of course paid for it with his life. And so others just said, we're gonna keep quiet as Lutherans and that wasn't a very good stance either. And so we we have felt you've got that's why we do not put flags on our sanctuary. Part of that debate was uh, we never want to get caught into a nationalism, a Christian nationalism, basically, which is what Hitler was promoting. Um, we follow Jesus first. Can you be patriotic? Of course, but you finally are uh, a follower of Jesus. And sometimes that. You say, God bless America. Look how God has blessed us through our country. But sometimes you got to stand up and say, mm, that's not righteous what we're doing here. Right? That's what we, that's what Lutherans learn. But now you even see the Germans are, are, are betwixt and between because they, out of guilt, have always supported Israel um, because of their complicity in World War II and the Holocaust. But even now, they're, everybody's shaky on this because. People acknowledge what's happening in Gaza is just unjust. Because they fear fear of more escalation because it's it's exploding. It's not just escalation, but just how the war is being waged is, um, I think, 
as a war crime. And, and Israel will have to pay for this later, or Netanyahu, or however that's done. You can't conduct war that way. It's breaking every norm. So here you've got both sides have something to say, but then you've got all this other messiness that comes in. And it's so it's hard when something gets this messy, it's hard to know what's the, what's the right move to make now. Complicated, yeah. And so, um, but it's not that complicated. <clears throat> Netanyahu knew about this ahead of time. He allowed it to happen because he was in political trouble in his own country. And then now he's starving people. Now, I don't know how you can justify the starving. And I would have, you know, if I were the president, I won't give you any of this money till 100 trucks go in. And then I'll give you part of the money. And then the next week, if you get 1,000 trucks in, I'll give you more of the money. I don't know why we just gave him more money. There you go. Uh, that's opening up a, a big conversation about, fortunately, our politics in Congress are so simple, we always do the right thing. And, <laughs> you know, and we, we can't make it simple, as you know, our Congress. And Congress can say, to, you know, allow it to go, but the president can say, I'm holding it off until this gets done. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know why he hasn't done that. And he just has not done that. I mean, that's the big question from one side is why don't you just, because our laws actually require that. And how that. They kill those people that were coming in with the trucks of food. Yeah, I mean, I think seven people died. I mean, that's a humanitarian thing. It's, yeah. I mean, there's no, there is no justification yeah. for that. None. So there is an internal debate here, but there's also, as you know, as you've read, in Israel as well. Now, part of what this would lead into is First Corinthians. That's my segue. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. But, but, <laughs> here, here's the segue for First Corinthians. See if, see, how, see if I did this well or not. Uh, it's a problem-solving book. So what we're saying is in the messiness of this war, where we actually identify with both sides, right? We identify with, with, with Palestinians who are suffering uh, unjustly. We, self, uh, we, we uh, identify with Israelis who also suffered unjustly and also under anti-Semitism. But there's a lot of hatred of Palestinians, too. Or, or just, I don't know them, so I don't care. It's 34,000 die, right? Don't, don't care. Um, with all that, is the gospel helpful in solving problems? Big ones, like this one, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, Corinthians is mm -hmm. going to do. We're going to see five big problems that it addresses. And you'll see how Paul uses the gospel to solve big problems. And those big problems are divisions in the church is the first one. Um, Fortunately, we've gotten over that in the United States, so we don't have divisions in the church. Um, Clearly, you jest. Um, I'm glad you picked that up. Right? <laughs> um, but we've become comfortable with the divisions. Uh, Paul is not comfortable with the divisions, so he's going to use uh, the uh, gospel to try to address what's going on. And here it's often... You get some really great speaker comes in, and then you get another great speaker, and somebody says, "Well, I'm going to follow that person, and I'm going to follow someone else." And um, you know, we call that church shopping today. I think, uh, uh, but Paul's going to take it on and says the gospel speaks to those divisions. The second one uh, is sex. Again, something we don't have to deal with here, um, but Paul did, and because Corinth. In, was a major religious, cultural, uh, and financial capital. And um, there were different practices uh, of sex, and not just the ones that we are aware of. But actually, if you were going to go see a prostitute, do you know where you go? Temple. You go to the temple. You go to church. <laughs> uh, and you go, whoa. Well, it was a great fundraising mechanism. <laughs> And that's how the church, that was a major way to raise money. Now, how could you do that religiously? Oh, quite simple. The church always can find a theological explanation. But uh, Aphrodite was often the temple of Aphrodite. And uh, you would go and have sex with the temple prostitute. By the way, that was practiced in almost every culture. So that's not just the Greek culture. That, uh, you go to Latin America, if you go to some of them. If you go to some of the places, the temples uh, throughout Latin America, um, 
this was always done. So temple prostitution was always a big deal because you would pray and um, through the sexual act in the church with prayers and you know all the rituals, God could uh, make you more fertile. So before the little blue pill, there was temple prostitution. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, it's a big deal. And so a lot of Christians have been practicing this, had seen this their whole lives. It was no big deal. It's kind of normal. It was kind of normal. And Paul's going, not normal. <laughs> okay, now he's going to make a gospel, notice, a gospel answer to the practical problem, not just an ethical one. So it's not just, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. It's not ethical. He's going to go back and say, okay, Christ died and rose again. Here's the gospel, and here's how that story applies to these problems. Yeah. Not just, I disagree with your, right. with your morality. So it's, then there's the food issue. But it's not just, are you eating kale or are you eating burgers at McDonald's? It's not just, how does food affect your body? But food was often sacrificed to the idols. This is what you would do at Rotary. Think Rotary. You're meeting, you start to say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? And then food is offered to the gods. It's just part of the public ceremony. And then it's passed out for everyone to eat. Can you participate in a ritual like that at Rotary? as a Christian. So it's pagan practices. And as we'll see, uh, this one divided the church dramatically because some would say, no, you're participating in a pagan ritual. You got to stand up and leave the rotary meeting. And others are going, well, that's embarrassing. These, this, is my, this is my guilt. These, these are the people I do business with. Plus, I don't believe in those gods anyway. I'm not worshiping that God, you know. I believe it only in Jesus. I'm just doing this to get along. Those gods don't even exist. And so it went back and forth. Because every guild, every profession had a guild that made these sacrifices. So it was just part of culture, right? Like saying the Pledge of Allegiance. For many years, certain churches uh, prohibited you from making any oath, even to your country, uh, because you made no oath other than to God. Right? So Pennsylvania Dutch, that still goes. Still goes, right? You can't, you can't, can't do it. And they, you know, have been called into court. They did not take an oath. They said, my word is my word. That was, that was the argument. I think we understand that, right? Yeah. If I, I'm patriotic, my word is my word. I'll say yes, but I don't ask me to swear on the Bible or, or give an allegiance to anyone but Jesus. Mm -hmm. that the, so that's a little bit of the taste of this third problem. The fourth problem is the gathering, the worship um, service. And you had some of this in Pennsylvania too, and, and certainly here in the South, is that the way they did their finances is that you would buy a pew or you would yeah. rent or lease a pew <laughs> seat. Well, some of the seats were more expensive than the others, right? If you didn't have much money, they make you sit with a choir up in the choir loft, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do I hear an amen? So all of a sudden, the rich got the better seats, the poor got the, and then who went to communion first? And then, then they'd have uh, meals afterwards, a fellowship, and, uh, there was this division that started to happen in the church, even in the way they conducted their rituals, where they sat, where they ate in the worship service. And Paul's going to go, eh. okay, could tell the gospel again, and say we can't have that in the church. Uh, and then finally, some are saying, and by the way, this is in our day as well, uh, the resurrection is all, not all that important when it comes to living the Christian life. It's all about ethics anyway. It's all about how you live your life. Isn't it all about just loving your neighbor? Haven't you ever heard a Christian say that? You know, all the divisions in the church, right? Catholic and Lutheran, Episcopalian, Mormon, you know, uh, Jewish, uh, Muslim. 
Oh, it's only really doesn't it all come down be good. Yeah, to to loving the neighbor. Golden rule. Right. Golden rule. Is that what it all comes down to? And sometimes you sit there and go, oh, I don't want to have this conversation. I'm just gonna agree with them. Well, that's what was going on here. They were saying really the resurrection plays no role. Um, so uh, Paul's going, whoa, and that famous line without the resurrection. Yes, we got nothing. Awesome. We got nothing. Okay. So this is a book that you've often quoted, that you've often used. Um, for example, one of the if you're going to get married, okay. which which chapter do you read? 13. 13. We just know this, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not about marriage, by the way. It's just a, a lovely uh, text about love. Uh, uh, Melissa, could you uh, just remind us, this is a short one. Again, it's almost used at every other wedding, but it, again, this is not what Paul's argument was. It's not talking to, he's talking to the church here, not to um, a couple. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am- Excuse me, what does that mean? If I speak in the tongues of men and angels? Uh, unknown language things look at the spirit if you speak in tongues right if, I, if i'm caught up in angelic language yeah. that's another way of you know charismatics or pentecostal they yeah. speak more in tongues which he affirms mm -hmm. paul's affirmed he affirmed that in 12 with spiritual yeah. gifts right. so he's saying yeah that works and even if i do that or if i don't do that and then he moves on right. i am only a resounding gong or have or a clanging cymbal if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Okay, so this comes down to the gathering as people were getting to, uh, to, to church. And for those who have been in, in charismatic gatherings, there's just a power to them as people are uh, excited, they're singing. It's a very powerful spiritual experience. But then someone can stand up and give a prophecy. And sometimes the prophecy is given in tongues. Mm -hmm. And so then you're going, what did they say? Someone I don't know. Right. So someone else has to stand up then right. and give an interpretation of the tongue. Yeah. But while they're giving the interpretation of the tongue, someone else might stand up and say, I got another prophecy. And someone else might want to say, let's sing a song. And it can become chaotic. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not just in charismatic gatherings, although this is, this is what he's saying is that the worship service, everybody's trying to outdo the other with their spiritual gifts. And as you remember, what's the metaphor he uses? First of all, he says it's about love. If you're all competing, right, it's not about love. And if you are, even if you're deeply spiritual and gifted and talented, but if you don't have love, you're like a... Oh, a, a gong or a clanging cymbal. It, it's just it's just noise. Mm -hmm. right. And I think we've all experienced that at one level or another, where mm -hmm. uh, and it can happen in the family. Everybody's trying, they're trying to share their gifts, you know, like look at me, look at me. Yeah. Um 
it, it's what's what's the famous quote from the from the actress? Um, so we're tired about talking about you. Let's talk about me now. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want that in the church, but it can happen because you know people are, would say, "I'm just trying to share my gift, right? I'm just trying to get my oar in the water." But it can become chaotic. And so how do you create order? And that's the spiritual gift chapter in 12. But he's saying, even when you recognize spiritual gifts and how they should function, if you don't have love, this thing falls apart. Oh, falls apart. Can I ask a question about translation? Um, on verse 3, um, Melissa, would yeah. you read your verse 3 again? Okay. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Okay, mine says, surrender my body to the flames. And that kind of got to me. Well, you can see why they changed it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Because it sounds I, like. So hard. Like a, a, like the protester outside of Don't Trump's that's just what I was or saying. a Buddhist yeah. monk uh, yeah, uh, uh, protesting the Vietnam War, remember, who lit himself yeah. on fire. It's kind yeah. of a classic. But um, no, I think what they're saying, it's not that, but it's a, it's a rhetorical device, right? Wow. We use, we try to think of a good rhetorical thing that's understood in context, but not out of context. Uh, I tell you, if I don't get something good to eat tonight, I'm just going to kill myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if I said that to you, you'd go, yeah, but, you know, I understand. Yeah. He's hungry. Yeah, yeah. He's not going to kill himself. That's, right. you know, that's just a rhetorical. Hyperbole. Right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's hyperbole, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you're the expert in those matters. No, I know. Yes. Well, you, but you, as a speech person, yeah, I mean, you know how to use hyperbole. But if then someone, if that was put in the translation and then read 500 years after I said it, they'd say, was he actually saying he killed himself? That must mean that pastor was unstable. I mean, you can, you can un see how that would, because 500 years, you don't know what the rhetorical device was, right? And so I think that's what that is here. That's my first guess at it. All right, are we ready for the... Remember, this is a problem-solving book. Uh, I should say, do you remember Acts chapter 2 at the end? Um, what it said about the church, the early church? When people talk about the early church, often they quote Acts chapter 2 at the end. Uh, let's see if I can find it real fast for you. And there we read... Um, the Fellowship of Believers, it's verse 42 in, in, in chapter 2, and you know this. Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? We know that text. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Everybody, Everybody loves good. each other, you know. And so you go, oh, boy, that early church, man, they had their act together. Until you read First Corinthians. <laughs> you go, oh, my goodness. The church has got the same problems we do. <laughs> so there's a certain comfort, I think, in reading First Corinthians, right? Because you go, oh, these are just normal people struggling to figure out their Christian faith in a situation that's just as complex as, as, as we can. Uh, one last thing from Acts, Acts 18. You don't have to, you don't have to look that up. But... Uh, um, this is part of Paul's second missionary journey. He goes to Corinth, establishes the church, spends 18 months there. So he's a mission developer. Like us sending somebody out to the park. He goes to Corinth 18 months, just like Will, establishes a church, and then leaves. And now he's hearing rumors that things aren't going well. It's falling apart. 
And so that's why he's now writing this book to say, okay, guys, get your act together. Okay. All right, are we ready? We're ready. Good. White man, good to see you. Oh, that's all right. Hi. 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 Roger, we have we should walk, wave and <laughs> all right, let's let's go in the first Corinthians. to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters one through four, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters 5 through 7, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church. One guy with his stepmother, a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to Greek gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrong-headed this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian, sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus's love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, 
And there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus, and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus, and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us. And so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul moves on and addresses problems in their weekly worship gathering. There were some people who were having really powerful spiritual experiences in the gathering. And so they would start praying out loud in unknown languages. There were other people who might start sharing a teaching or a word from God, and then someone would get up and interrupt them because they wanted to share. And it all was really chaotic, and it was distracting people, especially visitors, from hearing the gospel. So in these chapters, Paul helps them think, first of all, about the purpose of this gathering to help them see what kind of behaviors are appropriate. He says the gathering is a place where God's Spirit should be working through everybody, and it should happen in a unified way. So he develops this cool metaphor about the church as a human body. It's one, but it has all these different parts, and each part serves a unique and important role. So he goes on to name a whole bunch of things that the Spirit does through all these different people, all for the building up of the church. That's a key phrase in these chapters. And Paul concludes that the highest value in the gathering should be a concept central to the gospel, God's love. And love is a key word in these chapters too. Love will compel each person in the gathering to use their role to serve and seek the well-being of others. So Paul applies all this to the Corinthians' problems. Some people think the purpose of the gathering is to have intense spiritual experiences or to get a chance to speak their mind. And Paul says, listen, I'm a big fan of powerful experiences of prayer, but if it distracts other people or freaks them out, I should stop it because I'm loving myself more than I'm loving those people. The gathering around Jesus should be orderly so everybody can learn and sing and worship and hear God speaking to them. The last problem Paul addresses is the issue of Jesus' resurrection and the future hope of Jesus' followers. There were some people in the church who were saying that the idea of resurrection is ridiculous and doesn't really matter to being a Christian. And Paul reacts to this big time. He begins by saying that the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel. We believe in it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive in a physical body after being publicly executed by the Romans. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then his death was meaningless. We are all still lost in our sin and selfishness. We should just stop being Christians. Paul then shows in detail how the resurrection was Jesus' victory over death and evil, how it's a source of life and power for us now in the present, and how it's a promise of future hope for the whole world. It's because of the resurrection that we have a reason to be unified around Jesus. It's the reason we have motivation for sexual integrity. It's the source of power for loving other people more than ourselves. And ultimately, it's our hope for victory over death. And so, Paul concludes, we do believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which means this. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. Okay. What did you pick up? Love, 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 love all around. Love. <laughs> Sounds like a Beatles song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love, love, love. Except it is linked with the 
gospel. Yes. So it's not just love floating right, out right, there as right. an idea. Right? So, yeah. What else do you pick up in this problem solving book? First part, first Corinthians. Next week in the second group. They had lots of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Or when they talk about the resurrection, you know, he just clearly says, <laughs> if we don't believe in the resurrection, we don't believe in Christ. Why do this? Okay. There is no faith. We have nothing. There's no power, no, right? No, there's, no, no, there's, no, there's nothing. Uh, his whole argument for what's happening in the faith collapses, right? It's not just an ethical teaching. It's mm -hmm. not just the Sermon on the Mount, let's say. I think a lot of it is your influence on others, too. Like you can do things and it's okay to do them, but depending on what your influence is on others. Yeah. If it's you're a bad influence, you shouldn't do it. And if it's not offended anybody, or then it's okay to do. So you get that's an interesting thing. argument, isn't it? Yeah. You know, one, uh, you're, you're referring to one about the meat sacrifice right. to idols. Right. Right. And so, yeah, go ahead, eat the meat if you're hungry. But if you're offending people, then don't, don't, don't do it because that's not what love. Now that's pretty simplistic because sometimes, as we know, it gets messier than that, right? But but it's a it's interesting that you can you're free in Christ to do both. Now, how is love being expressed? Right. I remember uh, uh, I think I've shared this story. Um, going from Germany, I'm sent to Africa uh, to work with the Baptists, um, who were very much opposed to drinking. So the bishop gets me to the side, puts his puts his arm around me, and says, "I know about Germans." You like your <laughs> He said, "You can drink all you want at home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How nice! Not in public, yeah. and no one can see the bottles." Very nice. That's like, what do you do? We buried them. We did bury them. Yeah, I know. So he said if people in the church saw us drinking anything, it would undermine our ministry because they were opposed to offending them. Now, I knew that the bishop would drink wine in Germany. But only in German, not right. not. I think he was telling me to do the same thing that he was doing. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But there you go. You're free in Christ to a point, because our people will will reject you if they see you drinking, because that's it's not what sin. holy people yeah. do. It's not what pastors do. That's just not what servants. They just don't do that. My dad had that rule. Uh, I think I've shared this story too, that we saw them dance for the first time when we were on a fishing trip in northern Minnesota. And mom and dad, because uh, my mom hated to camp, hated to camp. And so I'm on her side. <laughs> for her, she said camping was a nice hotel with a great restaurant in the yeah. middle of the woods, right? right. Yeah. And so as a gift to the family, right? She she'd go on these uh, week-long um you know portaging and living off the land you know you, we ate only what we caught we didn't catch anything so <laughs> we had to bring canned foods with us which meant you had to carry canned foods over four oh, hundred percent it was uh, and so as a payback he had to take her to the finest hotel you know in Duluth um <laughs> on the way back well then they you know we're, we're young kids and they got out on the dance floor and not only did they dance they were good and we're all just you know Whoa, oh man, you know, who are these who are these two people you know, <laughs> pretending to be our parents? And so uh, asked Dan after he said, oh, my rule was never to dance or to go to a movie in the same county as my congregation. Uh -huh. He said if somebody would have seen in Maryland at that time, rural Maryland, if somebody had seen me dance. Oh, you're up. Yeah. Vertical fulfillment of a horizontal desire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, I, that was preached to me. I know, I know. That was the old joke when oh. they started dancing at Wheaton College. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, uh, we can't let our our our, our kids have premarital sex because it'll lead to dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
funny. <laughs> well, dancing will lead to premarital sex if it doesn't be reversed. Well, that's why it's funny. Because yeah. it became more opposed dancing than the premarital sex after a while. Uh, and, but you know, some of us grew up. That was the piety. There was just oh, certain sins you didn't. You uh, gambling, card playing. It wasn't just gambling that came. Card playing, uh, uh, drinking, drinking, dancing, smoking, smoking, smoking oh, right? Yeah. Infant baptizing. There was just certain things that yeah. certain groups were very, very, very opposed to. And so, uh, Dad knew that. And so. But it was interesting that he said not dancing or going to movies. And he said it was the same thing. If I went to an R-rated movie that I thought was really good and was walking out of the movie and someone in the parish would have seen me, it would have been a it would have been a critique. You know, I saw the pastor coming out of a scandalous, you know, scandalous movie. So that was his rule. And it was according to really first Corinthians. I'm free to do these things, they're fine, it's not sinful. But if my people can't handle it, don't to, I don't do it to, to love them. Not, you know, it's not only the negative, not offend, but that's how I can best love them. Because then I create a moral issue for them. And we know some people have stepped out of the church. If, if a clergy does something uh, wrong, oh, yeah. <laughs> then they and then they don't go back. It's not like they go to another church. It's yeah. just they become so offended yeah. um, that they, they just stop going to church, period. Um, you know, you have that with the clergy abuse, so those are obvious sins, but sometimes it's just honest stuff. But that person doesn't see it as an honest thing. They see it like dancing or, right. or going to movies or, or, you know, who knows what else, you know. So, so that's a really powerful argument here. Free in Christ, however, love has to... Has to... What, what else did you see in these arguments? I want to emphasize again the discipline of tying ethical instruction to love, but also to telling the story of the gospel. Each time, it's not just like Christians, this is what we do. It's rather Christ died for us, paid the cost, let's say, for our sexual immorality, and now has called us to take care of our bodies because we will have resurrected bodies. So we take care of our bodies. And part of that is sexual integrity. Now, I, I would point out, of course, sexual integrity is an evolving concept. What that means, what that doesn't mean. We all have seen that just over our lifetimes, right? Something that may have been prohibited or allowed 50 years ago uh, might have changed. So in other words, our understanding of integrity. And so often, even, our, even in our uh, commandments in our catechism, we say God calls us to sexual integrity. Even though, again, our understanding of that uh, can change over, over time. But it was a gospel. Jesus died, Jesus rose for your bodies, not just for your some platonic idea of love. And so you have to take care of our body. That's, by the way, why we do the, the funeral rituals. Now, this argument also, for many years, argued that you could not do cremation. Oh, because that would offend this argument of the gospel. Jesus died uh, so that he would be raised from the dead. Therefore, we take care of our bodies. And cremation would be, it was argued not that long ago, uh, you can't um, be cremated because it's not tending to the body. It's not honoring the body for which Jesus died. God can put the body together. Well, that comes later, right? And then, and then people start arguing with like the integrity right. question. Oh, no, that... My God could do it. He can do that, sure. right? And, and by the way, if you're buried even with honors, uh, with the body intact, it's still going to be right away. dust. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, it just, just, takes just takes longer. It takes longer. Yeah. And, and, and so then there was, a, oh, okay. Okay. However, I think you all have friends, and maybe you're that way, where, where people say, I just can't do that. Yeah. Or sometimes your parents will say, no, nope, can't, can't, I just can't do it. And that's fine because it's still part of the argument. Yeah. Jesus uh, arose so that we could preserve our bodies. We'll have heavenly bodies. And we want to therefore honor and uh, take care of the body that we have. This is, you know, some would say the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? right? So what we eat, 
exercise, drink, all those things are part of living out, honoring the body for which Jesus But that's died. when we're living. Now, after we make the transition, dust to dust, ashes mm -hmm. to ashes. Right. So what is the right. difference there that uh, you have to be buried with the skeleton? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's two. Uh, because when you're raised again, doesn't uh, Christ give you the new body right. and wherever you are? Because look at all the people that died, uh, the Jews. They were all buried together in one. They were cremated. In the cremated. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's, that's a Jewish argument for not doing cremation. Yeah. Is, yeah. is yeah. an honoring yeah. of the Holocaust yeah. tradition, right? Yeah. Of saying, never again will right. we be burned. Right. So that. Um, yeah. I uh, understand that. Yeah. But yet Christ took those souls. They're already saved, and the spirit goes to him. So the body is go back into the universe. Well, uh, we get we get heavenly bodies, and that uh -huh. now comes the mysterious question about what is a heavenly body. Now, all we've got is the stories of Jesus. So he's raised. Uh, I've always said I just found great comfort that he ate. Fish, yeah. world fish. I thought, oh, you know, we're, gonna eat. Have we're still gonna, you know, have, we're still gonna go out to restaurants and have <laughs> <laughs> we think well, that's glorious, you know. Uh, so uh, he walked though through walls that would appear. Yeah. He would just appear places and mm -hmm. then he'd disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and yet, did the disciples recognize him? Not immediately, but then when he broke bread or he spoke Mary's yeah. name. Or uh, he said, look, you know, you can touch me. It's me. I'm not a ghost. Something. Uh, yeah. Something happened to happen. So we're not given a whole lot of information of what the heavenly body is. Mm -hmm. So, again, how to respect this body by, by saying that, that um, usually we say god's creation god takes something and creates it he doesn't create ex nihilo in that sense he takes mud mm -hmm. takes dust and makes humans so i think the whole idea was of preserving the body or preserving the dust mm -hmm. was that's the raw material mm -hmm. god will use to recreate because the spirit it. is still with christ after you make the transition no matter if the body is being cremated or that's one buried. that's one of two theories Unfortunately, I'd love we'll to give you one theory, but <laughs> there are two theories. Some say when um, when you die, it's all dead. Soul, body, and spirit, it's all yeah. dead. And you wait for the resurrection. Yes. Of, of uh, the last time. And he will times. give you that body that you need to come back sure. with. Correct. Yeah. At the end times. But if the spirit is Jesus and God, how can it be dead? Because to me, your it's spirit, eternal. Your spirit dies. My spirit, okay. But, but I'm God. thinking inside of me is Jesus. So I guess that's the part I'm having a hard time understanding. Because he left the Holy Spirit to be our advocate. And, and to me, that's a holy sanctuary. So I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time separating the two. So, so the two theories, again, one is uh, when you die, everything dies. The other theory was the one you were saying is that the spirit goes to heaven and yeah. waits for the end days of the resurrection of, right. the, of, of mm -hmm. the body. So those are the two theories that are in the Bible. I like that today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah, that's right. Right. That yeah. criminal on the cross, doesn't right. it? And today you will be with me. The exact interpretation that I hate to hear is, yeah. well, is purgatory. Right. Mm -hmm. Not going there. <laughs> Not going there either. So, but you know uh, you're dead and you have no sense of time. So you don't know whether so you're... So that's the argument exactly. on the one side. Exactly. You know, I, I die. Right. You don't know. It's, it's called, uh, I think it's called eternal sleep, you know, yeah. and so then... You don't know. You know, just like at night, unless you have to get up at three o'clock, go to the restroom. But yes. <laughs> or, or a couple times. Yes. <laughs> Depending uh, on how your bladder is doing. Uh, <laughs> but but that, that's the argument. It doesn't sure. matter. On the one on the first theory, it yeah. doesn't matter because you'll just wake up in heaven. The other is you do act, you do exist as spirit, mm -hmm. uh, but really the promise of Jesus was the rest of the body, not of the spirit. Everybody believed that the spirit and the Greeks all felt the spirit was immortal. Right. But there's a Greek that went to yeah. have a new body. You're Greek. They yeah. will come back. <laughs> Jesus will give them a new, a body. new body that they 
Correct. Right. Right. That's the, the, the second theory. Because you get a new body in both theories. Because you're, okay. And they're not just theories. They're, they're in scripture. Both right. of them come from right. reading scripture. Yeah. So, And we don't know a whole lot about theories of spirit, soul, and body. Right? Even in our medicine today, right? They're, they're discovering new connections between mind and body, for example. Mm -hmm. Can one exist outside the other? Can your mind exist without your body? But you said it's in scripture that we will get new bodies. Is that from that's the Did sort Jesus of the core say gospel? That, or is that something the apostles wrote? The whole scripture is inspired by God. I know. <laughs> so, so nobody knows. I don't know why we we spend a lot of time on it. Who knows? It's it's I think it would we'd say it's the core of, of the gospel on all the New Testament is that as Jesus was, so will we be. So uh, the whole idea is that he promises um, the resurrection of the body. That's why it's part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the whole line of things, and one of them is the resurrection of the body. Yeah. So it's one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from almost every other religion. Well, everybody somehow, figured, well, not everybody, but most religions have some sort of immortality of the soul. But almost nobody has the resurrection of the body. It's it's and part of it is we're saying God is redeeming God's creation. God doesn't let you, as God's creation or the world, just burn up in flames. Do you remember the Left Behind series? You yes. know where it, it's like God's gonna come and everything's gonna get burned up, but He'll just save a few through rapture. Right. That's antithetical to the Bible announcement. That God will redeem God's creation, all of it, us, but also the world. So we're the reason we take care of creation and the environment is because that's what we think God's project is: is redeeming the whole world. And we just we, we take care of it as a foretaste, like we take care of dead bodies, right? because we think that's the future: resurrected body, resur a, a, a redeemed world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not God comes because if you think God's going to destroy everything in the end, anyways, well, why even do any environmental good at all? Because it's just going to be burned up anyway. Taking care of our bodies, what how does that answer to the abortion issue? Or don't go there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think you always would come back to what you saw how Paul's arguing. How does love play out? Right, so how, and, and we're, we're making a love argument here, mm -hmm. right? So any of any any moral issues, he's going to go back. Here's the gospel, yeah. and then what does love dictate? Mm -hmm. And again, I think we see fifty years ago, hundred years ago, uh, different understandings of how love plays itself out. Right, right? again, different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, One of my last conversations with my aunt she said you know Edith I've already asked the Lord that in my resurrected body could I please have smaller feet she wore an 11 to 5a <laughs> I like a, I like a smaller waist I want the one I had when I was 25 yeah and those those are the unanswerable questions you come back yeah you're going to get 25 35 45 55 you know uh, when how and what does the resurrected body look like? And, and uh, what also, what tasks are we doing? It seems like there will be work in heaven. Uh, I'm a firm believer that, that Paul's clear. Uh, Billy Graham used to say, you know, he, he wanted a galaxy to, to govern, you know, because <laughs> that's sort of mentioned that, you know, the children of God will, will kind of govern the universe and, and certainly allow the universe to govern. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I want my own little galaxy somewhere. That's kind of what the uh, Billy Graham was saying. <laughs> and it was tongue in cheek, but he's he's reading yeah. scripture and, and 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 having fun with it. Yeah. All right, we want to break up and, and talk about first of all the method that Paul uses. And we were kind of, you know, with your abortion question, you're kind of getting at it. Okay. How does the gospel let's tell a story again? And then how does the love that flows out of the gospel attach not just to these problems, but the ones that we face? Mm -hmm. what, what does love dictate mm -hmm. and you know I, I can still remember my, my dad was uh, you know these are Lutheran 
you know, because we take it from Paul. But, but, you know, he'd say sometimes, ah, uh -uh, don't go there. You know, the Bible says ethics. You can't do that, or, or you know. And you're going, wait a minute, how about the love? No, don't give me that love stuff. You know, <laughs> love is wishy-washy, right? <laughs> well, that's not how Paul's arguing. Yeah. Actually, love is very concrete yeah. in solving. He goes from the divisions to sex to food to, to how uh, the Christian church interacts to the, the resurrection. So he's kind of showing us how to do the life of deception, the moral life in community. So we kind of got to kind of practice this because this is not the way we're used to thinking because some of us are just fundamentalists. You know, we just read the Bible, so you got to do it because right. why? The right. Bible says so. Well, how about love? No, the Bible is God's word. That's how I'm going to do it. What's your and that's not Paul's. He's saying, here's the gospel. And the gospel then points to loving the neighbor. Now, how does that work itself out in all the decisions we have to make? It's a very different method, right, than, than how some of us grew up. But your father showed love to his wife by taking her dancing and to a nice place to eat. In Duluth. Yes, in Duluth. <laughs> in Duluth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, just break up in our groups and that stuff.